we're gonna we're gonna kick things off. Um, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Emily Olman, and I am the chief media officer at Hopscotch Interactive. Uh, and I am uh, we are a media services agency. I founded in the Bay Area in 2015, and I am going to share with you a few of the things we've worked on recently to kick things off. <clears throat> Here we go. office leasing. Uh, during the pandemic, our team even used drone photogrammetry, as you saw, to help create socially distanced Chinese New Year celebrations in San Francisco's Chinatown when it was shut down uh, because of the pandemic. So you may be wondering, how did this all happen? Well, when I first started experimenting with reality capture in 2015, something clicked for me. I grew up in a construction family, and my father was a general contractor and architect. So being on job sites was a native environment for me, but it had sort of laid dormant for a few decades. And reality capture brought a new way of seeing the world to my life and led me quickly to virtual and augmented reality. It was sort of the next deeper immersive experience. So as part of my explorations on these topics, I've shared my learnings with others via the Hopscotch Interactive YouTube channel, and also as a frequent speaker at conferences such as Augmented World Expo, Realcom, and now GeoWeek. Yay! Uh, I've been evangelizing the use of XR and now for some time and has seen its application in many fields from medicine to entertainment, but it has always been the practical applications of XR that have resonated the most with me. Um, so having created Digital Twins since 2015, I've developed a sense of pride when I see colleagues producing best-in-class advances with their technology. Their wins, are my wins, their wins are our wins, and their wins are your wins. And one of my pet peeves, of course, is that whatever the current hype cycle is, it sort of distracts everyone from the actual great work that is being done by real folks building real solutions and grinding on their visionary applications every day. So, since I love VR, I love AR, I love all things related to it, um, this past weekend I attended Space Explorers the Infinite. Has anybody gone to this yet? Anybody heard about it? No, yeah, okay. Well, I hope that you get a chance to try it out. It's a free roam VR spacewalk taking participants 250 miles above the Earth onto the International Space Station. And while I was looking down at Earth, experiencing something of my own overview effect, let's see, um, which is sort of this feeling you get of awe when you see the planet, I was reminded that having the ability to see our world in a new way and to gain perspective, such as seeing the Earth as a whole planet, is one of the many reasons that XR continues to have such a profound effect and impact on my life. XR is good for many things, but is extraordinary at creating immersive environments that can bring new perspectives to projects as a whole or to illustrate critical elements in impactful ways. 
So, when you see the media presented to you today by my colleagues, keep an eye out for how many of your projects could be better understood by the ability to present both the universal as well as precise mission critical information with XR. And in a talk I gave uh, this past November to an audience of real estate media professionals, I reminded them that the first scanned photograph of Russell Kirsch's infant son, Walden, in 1957 brought us our first pixel by asking the question, what if computers could see the world as we do? So in barely a generation, we have seen the advancements of visualization go from a mere pixel to a fully spatial interactive content with six degrees of freedom and a semantic understanding of the world around us. The practitioners of advanced visualizations you will hear from today are also pioneers. And just as the team that sent Apollo 13 to the moon and achieved amazing things in the early days of computing, we can all look to what is possible today in the early days of XR as a roadmap towards what it will enable for us in the future. So as Bill talks to you about leveraging digital twin data with AR, or Mark shares how he and his team provide value by animating reality capture, or Sander and Martin share with you their successes utilizing virtual field visits, and Nick illustrates how XR solutions align teams with remote collaboration, it will become apparent that creating real-world value using XR is something within the grasp of every single person in this room. So with that, you know, I just want to say one more thing, and that is that the, la the thing that excites me the most is that nobody here needs to add a marketing spin on it. We don't need to sell the metaverse to anyone, and that's because enterprise XR applications illustrate that once deployed, all other visualization tools will appear antiquated vis-a-vis -vis the power of utilizing XR to produce actionable results. So with that, I would like to welcome my uh, colleague, first speaker, to come up and take the podium. slides come up. Well, I'd like to thank the Academy for <laughs> <that speech. laughs> So just a little, I'd like to give a little bit of a credibility statement, but I've been in infrastructure, whatever is the coolest thing in infrastructure. I was going to be an architect, that was too touchy-feely, I was going to be an engineer, CAD came along, and it was all over. I just became a tech guy. And I've just chased that all through my life. I've worked for a lot of companies, and now I'm totally geeked out on augmented reality. I'm just like all in for it. And so what I want to talk about today is augmented reality for the built world. I'm going to start with some basics. Some of you are probably way, know way more than me, but I just want to set a foundation. And then just talk about how it's being used, who are some of the players in our world. So what is AR? It's really adding some new content, overlay it into your camera view. I like to, and I'm really focused on located AR, so content in the real world, in a real system. And then of course you need some sort of mobile device to do that. So you can see the different kinds of things that people can do. You can put a 3D model in situ. You can do the same things you can do on your CAD desktop. It's actually really stable. This is the iPad shaking a little bit while they made the video. And here we'll see another, one of the frailties of AR a little bit. But here we see some pipes. These are supposed to be underground. So sometimes the visualization can be a little difficult. <laughs> but if you look at this, this is just awesome. Oh, wow. Where you can see uh, this underground. Oh, I'm sorry, there must have been some video and a voice on there. And it doesn't just have to be 3D models. It can be interfaces. Here's another frailty of AR. Our geospatial location people will love how they located that steel column. And then this, I just saw this video put up the other day. But it's another of those examples of showing uh, AR in a scene. So, so where is it being used in construction? There's 3D models. So you can show what's <coughs> locating hidden items, showing them under the ground. 
progress review, how much of this has been put in, or QA, QC on placement, is the HVAC duct in the right place? And layout, there's even some versions out there on layout. I'm a little skeptical of the technology's quite there yet as you're moving towards the layout line. The line's moving, but anyway. And then a whole bunch of other categories of remote support, training, instruction and guidance, architecture review, more than just show me the structure, but what does my house look like on the mountain? What does my view out the window look like when I walk over here? And then, of course, navigation as well. And so here's an image showing uh, training, support, and guidance. So in real time, recognizing the thing, showing you where you're supposed to push the button or turn the thing. Now, when it comes to location, I'm really focused in on location. There's, of course, geo or world scale. And all through here, I use GPS generically. And this crowd, I'm not usually speaking to people who would know what I meant if I said Galileo or GNSS. But GPS, just a geospatial system. And then VPS is really on a site. And we'll look at that a little bit. What's in this location? Or it could just be within the room. An iPhone that's in your pocket can see where the walls are, see where the floor is, and understand the space pretty easily right out of the box. And so you might just need not a precise coordinate system, just within the contents of a room. And then there's what I call on this thing, or topology mapping. And that's more when instead of trying to scale the whole world, you get an exemplar model of a thing. And then you can place, as you're walking around and look, you can have located items on the topology of that <coughs> thing, like Azure anchors. Or at this point, I just put a point on the top of the table, and you've located the thing there, and we're all looking at a scaled version of the building, or the monkey with a banana hat dancing, whatever is your fancy. And so for all that to happen, you have to have an AR-capable device. I love this HMD head-mounted device. Those same engineers called the Apple Watch a wrist-mounted device. But, anyway, uh, and you, but you have to have the content, of course, that you're going to show. And it can be highly rendered, you know, uh, photorealistic rendering. It can be video. It can be text. Then you have to have a coordinate system. It could be a geo-coordinate system or the data within a building within a thing. And then the content itself, it's a nuance, but the content itself needs to know where it lives in that system. It needs to know its place in that coordinate system. And then the device has to have some kind of technology to be able to locate where you are within that scene. Again, GNSS. So out of the box, if you're trying to use an iPad, it's not that good, right? The GPS positioning. But a couple of zeros, a few hundred dollars, you can get down to a couple of meters. Three zeros, a few thousand dollars, you can get tighter and so forth using that. And of course, the position is better than the azimuth. For every degree off the compass is, at 100 feet, you're off close to two feet. And so if you're off five degrees on your compass at 100 feet, you're off 10, 12 feet. So things start to get pretty bad if the compass isn't tight. But there's lots of tricks and things we do to overcome that. Now, VPS, a virtual positioning system, there's sort of two steps to it. One is you have to reality capture the site somehow. The most common method is with photogrammetry. It's sort of a customized photogrammetry because it's looking for colors and shapes, but it's making a mesh, and it's an exemplar model, and you store that exemplar model. Then in real time with the device, using the camera on the device, it's doing photogrammetry in real time or computer vision, and it's figuring out it's finding those relationships. Pretty much how the Shazam can recognize a song within a few seconds because they've put the songs into mathematical patterns. They've taken the topology of the building and there's flat surfaces that are related to each other, there's colors, there's shadows, there's edges. 100,000 square foot building, you can locate the user in two seconds inside that spatial map and keep them amazingly involved. And we can see that, um, let's see if this runs here. So here you can see it in real time what's happening. These are the points that are in that exemplar model, and this is how many of those points are being used to keep track of where the user is as they're moving through that space. There's another way using beacons. For our survey friends, you shoot in a grid of beacons. You put Wi-Fi beacons throughout the building. They don't have to be on an exact grid, and then you're gonna triangulate from them. <coughs> but you're using not just the angle azimuth, but you're using the signal strength to determine distance, and so the accuracies can be off 
but it can be used for certain workflows. It also can be used to correct the compass if you have a couple of known points. This, you might want to have your camera out if you're interested in building your own or understanding who's doing what. But here's a whole list of people that are, these are all companies that are doing 3D models. Acular, I think, is going to speak next here. Argyle was one I showed you, the video of the HVAC stuff, a couple of the big players. Uh, Visualive will probably be a big player. They're owned by Unity, but I haven't seen much coming out of them. So just some people but that you can keep an eye on. And then I tried to come up with some categories here. But um, basically, the training and support, one of the big players there is LibreStream. Um, on the platform product, what I'm saying there is a tool you can buy and start creating your content and putting it out in the world. Uh, KP9, the WorldCast, uh, Will McReynolds is a wild man and has a really great product out there, and just some of the others. And then, of course, just basic technologies that you might want to use. A lot of them call them no code and low code. I'll just tell you, if you see that, it's a code word meaning code. <laughs> how many word processors say low code word processor? It's coding, but you know, there's just a lot of people throwing the technology in there and they haven't built out all the nuances for the full support. So it's, if you're a coder, it's a great environment, a great way to get started. Now my passion, I thank you for letting me tell you that. I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're doing, but I want to hyperlink the world. I want geotags everywhere. How many people in here have spent their career locating things for major corporations, for little companies? We have this database of where all those things are. How many people are doing digital twins? And BIM, you've got all this information. The guy's standing in the building in front of that sign. There's three databases and an edge computer on the other side of that wall that have so much information he needs, and he can't find it. He can't get to it. He spent all this money. I wanted him to be able to look and see that hyperlink and find that thing. And I think AR is a perfect use case for that. Whether it's in your factory, or your facility, or your roadway, your city, your oil and gas, go into that plant design system, find the location of the pump, find the five other applications that know about that pump, and give the user a path to that thing. We coined this term tagosphere when we were a little bit more focused on the commercial consumer market but basically just this concept of this hidden layer of information. It's world scale, it's organized, so you can filter out things you don't want, and you can connect it to your enterprise spatial data. You can do it indoors, you can do it outdoors, and really the concept for us, if you see here, the user's outdoors, we figure out where he is, and we go look in a location truth system. What assets are within 50 meters of where this guy's standing? Take those asset numbers and go search through other databases. Find relative links. Maybe a practice manager has laid this out. And then offer them up to the user. All the user needs to do is look and pick and see what's available. It's a real simple concept, but we think super powerful. And I talk about people having digital twins. I say, is it a digital cousin or a digital twin? <laughs> I really want it to be. I'm in this metaversal world of my private, real-world metaverse. So thank you very much. There's my information. I am speaking again later. If you enjoyed this uh, wonderful show, <laughs> anyway, uh, please do contact me. Love to talk with you. My information's up there. And thanks for listening, and thanks again to the Academy. <laughs>
It's great what 20 bucks in an hour can do, and you can put some animation just like that together. But I figured since I'm talking about animation, I might as well show you some animation. So anyways, a little bit about myself. My name is Mark Franklin. My education is in mechanical design. Currently working for a company called Kleinfelder. I have 22 years experience, uh, mostly in the industrial engineering space. Uh, I have a lot of different positions over the last 22 years, but I currently run our design and reality capture lead. Uh, very blessed that the beautiful wife, 12 year old daughter. We live in the wonderful city of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Go Oilers. We also have a nine month, 85 pound Bernadoodle who just graduated from kindergarten. So we're super excited about that. <laughs> For those who don't know what uh, Kleinfelder is, it's a group of about 3,000 plus innovators, uh, engineers, scientists, surveyors, and construction professionals scattered throughout US, Canada, and Australia, working, working in a variety of uh, key markets in the engineering world. <clears throat> So now that you know a bit about me, let's just jump right into my topic. So the intent of my topic today is to not showcase the most cutting edge tools, the ways to execute animation. You'll see from my colleagues and what people like Will are showing that there's a lot more cool stuff out there for sure. My intent today is to come from the other side where I can see many companies struggle in knowing where to even start when it comes to adding animations into their current workflows. So why use animation in engineering? So five years ago, um, I'll, I'll take a step back. So why use animation in engineering? Animation in engineering becomes a clear way to study, analyze, and showcase a simulation of a whole system within its intended environment. So that provides context for intricate designs, uh, allowing engineering teams to find flaws and help explain complicated issues. Five years ago, when we were looking at ways to better capture existing facility data, we discovered 3D reality capture. We brought that capability in-house. We taught our own engineers and our designers how to do the 3D scanning themselves. So by going to facilities, 3D scanning, collecting a point cloud that can be inserted into a design software, while also collecting the 360 degree <coughs> photos, gave us a better starting point for collecting that data up front than relying on the old unreliable drawings or CAD models that we often would deal with in the past. Over the last uh, five year time period, we've gone from a firm that really did no reality capture to now utilizing that on about 95% of all jobs in Canada. So this data has made the quality of our engineering packages and deliverables increase by leaps and bounds, but it also got our teams thinking, what else can we use this data for? And how can we better describe and showcase our engineering work? So the problem is, there is so much out there and it's evolving so quickly. Reality capture, AR, VR, MR, AI, ML, you name the acronym, it's really hard to keep track of it all. <clears throat> you compound that with budgeting, what technology you want to bring into the company, along with having 3,000 plus employees at different levels of technology, know-how, and it really gets complicated on how and where to begin. So, can we do stuff in-house? Can we do it, uh, do we have to hire animators to come in? And the answer is really maybe. But I'm also a big believer in just starting with baby steps. You don't need to really climb the mountain on the first day. Just take that first step. Then a few years later, you look back and you're uh, surprised at how far you've actually climbed. So we started small, using software that we already have, like Autodesk and Recap. Simple videos showcasing where something was going to be placed. We utilized these uh, videos with our clients and included them as part of our final deliverables that we gave to the construction team. So it was easy to teach our designers how to create these clips themselves. They were already familiar with these uh, design products. We just had to show them how to use it. So like showcasing how this yellow pipe is going to be installed in Recap. Bringing that model back into those like Recap photos was our baby steps into augmented reality. So then by looking into other software, we also noticed that a lot of them have basic tools already for creating videos and animation. We discovered easy to use video editing programs like your Windows Video Editor, which comes free with your PC, was enough horsepower to put most of the walkthroughs together. <coughs> So this gives our design team the ability to cut and create a clip that they think can be included as part of an animation to tell the story of one of our projects. Since we aren't aiming for an Academy Award uh, winning film, we just want to create an animation that shows the basic new design. So often it's just basic stop motion or short screen grab showcasing how it's going to be installed or how clashes or the clashes we need to watch for. So we start with a basic storyboard, nothing complex basic bullet points of what exactly is going to be happening within the project and what steps are required. And then we create clips to match the story. Just having a designer put together the storyboard 
and listing the steps, it actually often brought a new element of scrutiny to the project where we would discover something needs to be changed due to the constructability or clashing. So in this example where we were story uh, boarding on how to cut and remove and replace three existing tanks within a congested building, we used this not only for the design review, but we included it as part of our bid package that we sent out to the vendors. And what we actually found out is by including these type of animations with the construction package, we received back a lot less questions on what was required for the project. And also the prices for the bids start coming back less inflated since there's a lot more clarity here around what the project is and what needs to be happening. In this next example, we storyboard out how we were going to cut, or sorry, in this next example, we actually came up with various options of how, how we were gonna remove these screens in a very congested area. Initially, the owner's business group was proposing putting large overhead doors in front of the screen to remove them out the front of the building. However, our team was able to create various stop animations in AutoCAD that helped them define the different levels and effort for each option, <coughs> like lifting it by crane through the roof. By delivering the different options to the virtual world, to their business group, we were able to create a better understanding of the positives and negatives of each solution. <clears throat> and in the end, it was decided that bringing them through the roof was actually the cheapest option out of all the different options, and something we wouldn't have been able to probably figure out until we started playing around it in the virtual world. Another large client we work for completes a major shutdown of an existing area within their facility each year. It's typically a 14 to 21 day window when they shut down a specific area and they complete a hundreds, hundreds of jobs in a short period of time. A few years ago, this 21 day turnaround had 2 million job hours scheduled in that 21 days. At the end of the 21 days, the plant restarted and they were happy, but they had spent an additional 1 million hours over that 21 days to complete everything. Since everything was installed and the plant was up and running, everyone was happy. I was pretty floored though by going over by a million hours that this was something to be happy about. But I guess when they're making a million dollars per hour, you know, it's more important to get up and running. But for us, we asked, why are we going over by so many hours? And it's often because many of the jobs, although they had thought they had planned out everything, they did not visualize it outside of a 2D construction package. This leads to missing smaller items like a cable tray, a piece of steel, and in, in this example here, what we're seeing is there was an exchanger, for example, where it's really congested area that we were trying to remove this piece of equipment in and out. So that's when we knew that we, anything we can do in the virtual world to, uh, before actually going into the construction world to visualize before can help us circumvent the things that clashes that we see. So we 3D scanned the area, we modeled in the trailer as well as the equipment, and then we were able to give step-by-step -step instructions on what needed to be modified prior to the removal as well as instructions on the movement of the trailer that it would have to make in order to get in and out of the congested areas. So utilizing animation and other exciting tools like virtual and augmented reality, we can better understand the construction, clashes, and safety prior to the shovels hitting the ground. So eliminating even 10 or 15% of those million hours far outweigh the time it takes to put together these type of animations. And that brings the project to life and it tells the story. At Kleinfelder, we also are blessed to have some amazing top talent in animations. We do utilize some higher end animation tools and have some animators on staff. Where polish and possible public presentations are required, utilizing these type of tools are very, are very uh, great. So I, I see the space growing and I see engineering firms hiring animators and videographers in the future since clients can now see the value of how telling the story of how a project is going to be executed can quickly pay off. The good news is, is that you don't need to be a trained animator to bring these projects to life, and chances are you can utilize a lot of the software that you're already working with. So start with defining the story you want to tell, and use baby steps to bring it to life in the virtual world. Thank you. So my name is Martin, I'm the CEO and founder of Ocular. Okay. There we go. So uh, Ocular is a 3D visualization platform, digital twin platform. So uh, we started the company in uh, 2018 um, just to visualize designs and to show how designs will uh, look like using AR at the time and new technology um, um, really to help place making. You know, how, how, does, how does this building uh, look like in, in the future? 
Um, and over time, we evolved, um, and we evolved a lot into you know visualizing on all kinds of platforms, but mainly in construction and operations, adding data to the 3D models that we that we visualized. We, as you can tell, work a lot with Magic Leap. Uh, Magic Leap 2 is a fantastic device, so we're uh, their AEC partner globally um, as a um, as a software that comes pre-installed in Magic Leap. We also work with uh, VR goggles, Oculus Quest, iPads, phones, you name it, and the uh, web, of course. Um, what I want to show you after this presentation uh, is, you know, and after the panel, is uh, one really cool solution that we developed together with WGI Engineering. WGI is a great partner of ours and has been for many years. So um, let me show you a bit of, um, you know, construction use cases. So basically, using MR. Um, in construction site to you know at, at construction site to really check and you know to validate your uh, design and your BIM model on site. Just play a quick video. So they, they love this. They, it's so much better than the iPad. So this is Shabbat. Uh, they're they're doing this. Uh, yeah, I can see that's the actual. So left side is his lab refurbishment. Boston, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, they love the technology. You put the goggles on, you walk through the construction site, and you see, you know, you don't have to real up, realign, recalibrate, you just walk through and you see it right there. Um, and then, of course, you can add, you know, data. You can add documents, you can add uh, workflows, you can, we're connecting to, you know, BIM 360, we're connected to Bentley i20. You can pull all of the data. Um, you know, and visualize it as you are walking through the construction site um, or an existing building for its sake. So, um, one of our biggest uh, clients is in the Middle East. It's a, you know, they're working on mega projects where you have 10, 12,000 people on a site at each time. And what they do is first they align in a VR room, they align uh, and discuss what they're going to show on site, and then they actually show it on site, um, as you can see the other picture. Um, so, and, and, and increasingly, they started asking us, we're working on their third project right now, um, and you have hundreds of people running around uh, the site with iPads and coordinating. And, um, you know, now, now they started add, um, adding the Magic Leap, and they started asking us about geospatial data. Uh, the investors started increasingly asking them about, okay, so can we add scan, uh, you know, laser, laser scan, LiDAR scans, can we bridge this beautiful BIM model that you have, you know, it's a federated BIM model from 400 suppliers, you know, subcontractors, um, and and so can we can we add the surroundings, and can we make sure that the BIM model sits, you know, in the reality in the scan? Um, but they started asking the, the general contractors, and they of course have not a lot of knowledge about that, right? So they need to start asking the engineers. So we turned to our friends at WGI. Um, and we started <coughs> developing a solution where you can make supplemental measurements in a combined BIM and geospatial kind of LiDAR scan uh, and point cloud. So what you see here is this is a BIM. So this is part of a you know, refurbished uh, travel center. You know, and it's, you, know, you are able to work together. Multiple engineers take supplemental measurements of the BIM and point cloud. So the engineers can see each other, they can hear each other, they can work together in the same, you know, in the same project on the same virtual field visit. Saves a lot of time, saves a lot of uh, cost, uh, and of course is overall very efficient. Um, you can see each other meeting, you know, you see an avatar of the engineer yeah. uh, right, right next to you and he can tell you what to do, you know, the senior can tell Junior, what to do, and, uh, and um, you know you can else you can just you can just uh, you know take the measurements and, and uh, that saves into your into your files. One really cool thing here is that you can go underneath the point cloud because this is BIM plus point cloud. So you can go underneath and you can actually take the measurements off the pipes and the infrastructure, or whatever underground, or whatever you not typically see in a point cloud, and then you can you know uh, do the do the. Uh, do the measurement. So yeah, with that, um, oh, one more thing, uh, and we'll have you try it uh, just before you walk out. 
Uh, we also use this for, uh, and this is a new use case that WGI came up with. Um, we also use it for measuring trees. So this is for uh, areas that are not easily accessible. Uh, WGI would fly with drones to the scan and then you can have people collaborate and work together and take measurements at the same time. Um, you know, this is really nice actually. It's a, I see it more as a therapy moving forward. So with that, um, I would like to invite Shandor um, from WGI, so the Senior um, Manager of the Geospatial, and he's going to give you a little bit more details on how they you know, use this technology in the field. Also adding data, right? Because you know, I've been just showing you the measurements. He's going to show you some really cool data. Good afternoon. Just give the slides a second to show up. And meanwhile, my name is Sandra Laszlo. Uh, I am the Senior Operations Manager uh, responsible for WGI's Geospatial Technology Group. My background, uh, I, I'm a civil engineer by training. I've uh, been a PE, and I made the transition into geospatial about seven years ago, mainly because of LiDAR and the technology <coughs> that is used. Uh, in my background, I did a lot of software development, so for me it was a natural transition to move into this environment with the spatial data and work and develop algorithms that allow us to extract actionable information from them. So, at WGI, our core values drive our culture, much like any organization. Uh, I've listed two of ours here, and they're relevant for the idea behind this application. Passion for people means many things, one of which is our commitment to never compromise on safety. Our focus on keeping our people safe is paramount to our success and is non-negotiable. Safety is always a top priority. Be the change you seek. This embodies many tenets, but for me the idea to promote efficiency and embrace technology are at the forefront of what we are doing with this application here. Safety, efficiency, and technology are all front and center in this concept. WGI has 25 offices spread out throughout the United States. In these offices, we have surveyors and engineers that are very technically skilled in their areas. And when we are trying to leverage that knowledge and it's and, and use it for projects, um, we need a good way to collaborate and bring those people together and their knowledge together so that they can work and work towards a common goal and visit environments where they typically would not have had the chance before. Virtual field visit. So placing collected and generated design data into a virtual environment supports collaboration that Martin showed. It allows various users to access the same site from any location, saving the time and the expense of mobilizing to the field. This application promotes safety by helping teammates visit locations virtually and out of harm's way. No need for traffic control to visit and gather information from within roadways or request permission to access areas that may be typically uh, inaccessible. Team members and clients alike can review a site from the convenience and security of the office. The VR environment opens up new possibilities for extraction of intelligent data. By placing the user in the environment, they're able to work within a point cloud or imagery in a way that leaves little doubt that the correct point was picked. While this is only a demo application, future versions will include view depth control and the ability to switch col cloud colorization from RGB to intensity. Spherical and planar imagery will be viewable in geoposition within the point cloud to ensure accurate measurements can be taken from the images. These enhancements will further the confidence a user has in the data that is extracted. Perspective is what this provides. VR lets us move through the environment in a way a field visit does not allow, whether it is getting eye level with the pavement to assess cross slope or moving up to the top of the utility pole to capture cross arm length. The freedom to move to any location about the data provides users with a valuable new perspective. 
and opportunity to gain new insights with the data. And while this is a demo for mobile LiDAR, any LiDAR can be used in various combinations with imagery, sonar, and even ground penetrating radar to provide a holistic, complete view of all the data. But what about extracted and design data? As Martin showed, the ability to import design data makes this a powerful environment to show client concepts, designs merged with existing landscape. True data integration, BIM, GIS, and 3D CAD data can be brought in and overlaid on points and images. This adds intelligence to the model and supports validation of not only positioning of features and line work, but also associated attribution. Pop-up menus in the VR environment make it easy for a user to navigate the data and locate related features. Future enhancements will help visualization of the relationships through visible lines linking related features like a web. VR is also a powerful QC tool, ensuring that models and extracted data align and meet the quality expected by clients. New tool sets will allow a QC team to visualize and check the connected nature of data, as mentioned while easily moving between features of interest. On the horizon is the development and integration of new tool sets that will allow users to take supplemental measurements and capture interconnectivity of features directly in the VR environment, moving out of the current 2D systems in a paradigm shift that will allow for precise selection of points without requiring generation of multiple views and cross sections on multiple monitors. In VR, the selections can be made by touching a point similar to measuring during a site visit. Except in VR, you can touch points that are 40 feet off the ground. The acceptance of VR usage in the industry is really in its infancy, as the headset technology improves along with the price point. It will find more relevance in how we interact with data in our own organizations and with our clients. Current popular extraction tool sets will begin to embrace operation in the VR environment and be adapted for use. Just as CAD is widely used today, and it will push VR from kind of a cool novelty into a workhorse for this industry. From topographic maps to building information models, virtual site visits promote safety, efficiency, and technology. So this is really just the beginning of what this, this application can do. And being able to visit the site from a desktop, sitting in an office 300 miles away, and collaborating with your peers is where we want to see this technology really go. And not only that, but it'll allow your clients to sit there with you and see the same things you were seeing as well. It really affords a lot of opportunity moving forward. So, uh, I, I do believe this is truly just the beginning. And thanks again to Martin and Acular for their partnership. And thank you all. Hi everyone, um, if you think about the fact that we've heard so much about the metaverse in the last two to three years, there's been a lot of press, a lot of hype about the metaverse, and I think it's fair to say that today there are those who strongly believe in it, without naming anyone, there are those who don't believe in it at all, and then there's more spe most people who sit somewhere in between, believing in it, but still wanting to be sure and convinced that it has value. Now, <clears throat> you notice that I've used the word hype when I referred to the metaphor a second ago, and that was intentional. If you look at the typical hype cycle, we know that for any new technology, any disruptive technology, we typically go through these cycles and these phases until we can really fully realize the value of the new technology. We would probably agree that we've been in the peak of inflated expectations in the last two to three years when it comes to the metaverse. We would probably agree that in the last six months, we've seen what the drought of disillusionment 
And I think that right now we're starting to go, to go up that slope of, of enlightenment. And you know what? I think that's great news. Because now we're out of Wonderland, we could start talking about where it really matters, what it really brings to the table, and what real solutions that it can bring to, to all of us. So, rest assured this is not a talk about the metaverse, or at least not officially. It's rather a talk about XR, and how XR can bring significant value in some areas today, like for example in collaborative design review, and all the examples that you've heard earlier with my, with my peers, but also about where XR is going to take us and where it's going to be bringing value in the coming years. So, and that's exactly my point. Now that we're done with this hype with the metaverse, we can focus on where it matters. So my name is Nick Fanta. I'm the general manager for XR at Autodesk. And I'm here today to tell you or share with you why I'm such a strong believer when it comes to XR and what it can bring to the table and what we believe at Autodesk it is bringing to us and to our customers. Um, we believe, or our vision for XR, is that it will completely revolutionize data interaction and project collaboration for every professional. That it will profoundly change how we work, how we re interact among ourselves, with our clients, accelerating digital transformation. Now, when you heard me say that I'm from Autodesk, I assume most people in the room know about Autodesk, but I'm pretty sure that there are people who don't know about Autodesk, and when I said Autodesk, they went, out of what? And if we were in a one-to-one -one conversation, what I would say next is that you heard about AutoCAD, and then you would go, oh yeah, AutoCAD. So yes, Autodesk is the company who builds and delivers AutoCAD, but we do way more than that. We deliver solutions for professionals in the AC space, of course, but also in manufacturing, and media and entertainment, and we help these professionals design and make cool stuff. For AC, for the AC industry, that means buildings, bridges, infrastructure, water projects, and so on. But generally speaking, this is what the professionals that we serve are doing with our solutions. Now, we started our transition to the cloud about 10 years ago. And what that means is that we started connecting our existing solutions to cloud services, and we started building tons of new services that are allowing the data to flow and people to collaborate and be connected. We've also started a transition towards what I call real-time in general, so real-time access to data, real-time connections between people, and more recently, we've embarked on our XR journey. And I'm not sharing this with you to brag about Autodesk. I'm sharing this with you because I believe that each and every one of you probably have to go through a similar transition in your journey to get to this transformation. And this is what the, one of the main key points that I got from the keynote this morning, actually. So, we've been looking at the industry, looking at trends, talking with customers, interviewing tons of people in the field, and we came to the conclusion that there are about six main use cases or opportunities where XR can bring significant value and it matters to us as a company. So in no particular order, this, this is what they look like. One of them is what I call designing in XR. This is about taking a creator and putting them in this immersive space where they could be fully creative in 3D, either by themselves or with others. Quite frankly, we see that starting today in more the conceptual phases and early, uh, early sketches, but we believe that eventually, the days where we design on the 2D screen will be gone. The next opportunity is what I call collaborating on design review. That one is probably well understood and known by most, most people. It's about bringing people together from anywhere in the world so they can look at their data and make the best design decisions as possible. The third one is slightly different. This is when AC professionals, if we focus and we look at this through the AC lens, when AC professionals are trying to convey an emotion, communicate a story to their stakeholders who typically are not professionals and don't necessarily understand BIM and 3D. The next one is when you start building. You're, you're, the, the construction has started, and you want to bring design on the site. And we've seen examples of that earlier with, from my peers. So this is about bringing design on the site to look at QAQC execution errors. But it's also about bringing the site back to the design to compare the two. The next one that we've identified is the one that I call training and assisting in operations. Either in virtual reality, to train people before they go on site and do a specific job, or to assist them when they're doing that job on the site so it's more efficient 
and they're guided in the operations that they're performing. And finally, the last one that we have identified is the one that I call the management of physical asset. So think digital twin, where you want to be able to make sense of all of that data, either in VR, in the, in the office, or as an augmented reality experience on the site as you walk on the site. So if we look at those, and we take a look at what a simplified view of the AEC project lifecycle would look like, and we plot these different opportunities on that map, it would look something like this. It's not an exact science, but you have experiences that make sense more upstream, closer to the design process, ones that are bringing value on the site, and finally, opportunities to leverage XR once the building is built to make sense of what it is and how it's performing. Now, what we hear when we talk to AC professionals and where they see value today, it's mostly in these areas. Early conceptual, that's starting to be a thing and becoming a thing. Definitely in the middle of that slide for collaboration and review, doing issue tracking, and as uh, some of my peers showed with coordination, we see that you could bring design on the site. Now, when I talk to AC professionals and I'm trying to make sense of what they're going through, we realize that builders struggle to completely validate a design until it is finally fully built. And they rely on instinct and abstractions to make design decisions. And let's face it, it's difficult. Some of the projects are extremely complex, involve many people working together, many different disciplines, and often many different firms having to coordinate. It's a big challenge. So in the end, what we realize is that they will be either lucky or play wrong when they're trying to make those decisions. So, going back to that, that chart, the piece that I have highlighted is where we see, at least for us, the most value being fully realized. There are other areas that are starting to see values, especially on the construction side, as my colleague showed before. But what I'm saying is that we envision that though the value is mostly realized in these areas today, in the future, we could expect the value to start bleeding in other adjacent use cases more and more in the future. And actually, I think that what will really happen is probably something more like this. And if you start putting data at the center, and you start really organizing and structuring the data, providing access to the, that data through cloud-connected services from anywhere, each of these different opportunities will be able to tap into that data and really fully realize the value that XR provides. So imagine when you can go anywhere on the site at any stage of the construction, on any floor, and you can say, I want to see the MEP data. And it's there, it's positioned, it's anchored, everything works automatically. And similarly, when we get better at, at scanning and bringing that data into, into the design to make collaboration and to do, to make those coordination between design and build, this is just an example of where, where we will see the value fully realized. So in the future, what we free, fully believe and strongly believe is that depending on what you're trying to do, whether you're at a home, at your cottage on the weekend, in the office, in the trailer, on the site, we will be able to provide to you just the right data, uh, just the right access to the data you need for the job you're trying to do. And this is when we'll fully realize the value of XR. And that's why I truly believe that XR will revolutionize data interaction and project collaboration for every professional. Thank you. And so I'd like to bring up our speakers, please, uh, so that we can ask a few more questions to them, and um, we might even be able to ask a few questions from the audience, which would be amazing. Uh, yeah, we're, yeah, this is fine. So that's great. And you'll be handed a mic. But the first question is actually for the audience. I would like to see a show of hands of folks who have used some type of AR or VR, XR already with success, well, with success, uh, in their companies. If you could just raise your hands, let us know. That's amazing. This is the first room I've ever been in. 
<laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. But it's great to see so many hands go up uh, because I know that this is an informed audience and so I'm really excited about um, what we're going to talk about today. So um, my first question is, well, thanks for, thanks for all the talks and uh, great stuff to present. These guys are amazing. They are pioneers. I will. <laughs> So the, there's a lot of industry buzz, and Phil, this is a question for you, about uh, AR glasses. Um, Google Glass failed, right? And now we have Magic Leap. Magic Leap 1 was sort of not as, uh, those, there were some inflated expectations around Magic Leap 1. Magic Leap 2 is now out. So what is your takeaway? Uh, maybe this is also a question for others. Please uh, chime in. Uh, but also, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on glasses, mobile AR? What is our window into this uh, visualization? And uh, oh, turn my mic. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, of course, several years ago when I first started on my journey with AR, I was like totally geeked out on the glasses and I say, there's a day in the future, Apple's gonna ship their glasses and the world's gonna explode and I wanna be there. I named my company Mavericks after a surfing site because I wanna ride that wave. And, you know, I've seen some of the best glasses out there. I've seen some of the best software that's out there. I'm not supposed to call 911 while you're sitting on the stage. <laughs> but I think in the case of if you have to have a hands-free, of course, it makes perfect sense and the technology is ready for that. There's some controversy, you know, is my safety guy going to let somebody walk around the site with a dimmed set of glasses that, you know, are they safe for the environment. So I think the use cases are there. I think it's gonna be, it's gonna progress over time. I use the analogy, you had that pixel thing up there. I use the analogy of television. You know, when I was a little kid, there was a three channels and they would roll on the screen. And now, you know, we all met by video to have a meeting and one of us was in Dubai in a convertible during the meeting. I mean, the world, a video has come this whole, you know, we can imagine it'll be there. But, you know, and everybody's doing it. Even the VR glasses all now have passed through because they realize AR is a, you know, the real world is an important thing too. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else want to add to that? Nick? I, I guess. I, mean, I, I agree. It's, it's inevitable. It's just getting better every year. We have ups and downs, but generally if you look at the trend, the prices of the device are getting more uh, affordable, more accessible, whether it's Meta, Apple, or whoever you want to join in. I, I'm convinced that we're just, the trend is in that direction and we'll see devices becoming cheaper, more comfortable, better battery life, um, and, and safer for the site or for whatever AR application you want to use them for. Yeah, I'll just maybe add, um, I, you know, definitely the companies that provide software need to be agnostic to the glasses and to the goggles. So these will evolve and they will change and new players will come. You know, and, um, I remember from the beginning of last year we were deploying a really cool VR room for one of our clients um, and, and we installed that on the, on the device. I'm not going to name it, but now it's completely obsolete. Um, you know, and that's, you know, 18, 18 months or so, completely obsolete and we spent tens of thousands of dollars on devices and the computers that are running the devices, they're still using it, but it's kind of in a corner of the room. You know, so so um, definitely be ready for a new device every year, I'd say. Absolutely. Yeah, the devices uh, do have a life cycle that is shorter than we all wish. Shorter than we all wish. So, uh, so I think that that's also sometimes people also say the vision was never even to be in goggles, was to be in a cave. If you talk to the, the VR cave and have a, you know, a 360 display around you, right, to free people from the goggles and the headsets, you always will have that form factor as an issue. Um, so I would like to actually ask, Mark, I, uh, since you uh, presented uh, Second, I wanted to ask you about clash detection a little bit because when we were seeing your presentation, you showed us uh, some things where obviously you had reality capture. Reality capture showed what was in the environment, and we were watching you know these things rotate through objects 
And I was, I was thinking, oh, well, wait a second. Like, is that a good display? Is that a bad display? Maybe you can elaborate on exactly For what sure. happens at that moment when somebody <clears throat> sees right. that there's a clash. I think honestly, that's probably why we started actually creating these videos for our clients, because we were actually starting to do that anyways in our CAD models. We would take a, a CAD entity and start twisting it around, and we would see, oh, see it hit something there, and then that goes to our civil engineer, and he's like, okay, I need to move this up, or she's like, I need to change this design, you know? So our designers would then actually take that and, and create a new solution for it. So then when we're creating those type of videos for our clients, that creates that value that we're able to now explain and say, look, see the trailer? It is hitting that piece of steel. How do our designers go about changing the design in order for that to fit in? How are we gonna move it? And so that's really enhanced our call QAQC process. And does the cost, so I think that that's another question that I, I think might be interesting for folks in the audience. I mean, the cost to develop, to develop the animations has to be so much less right then finding out too late i mean you know like you said you get lucky or you're wrong uh nick and i think that that's uh how much money are we talking about how much do you think can be saved i mean if you're if a project is, is of a certain scope that's right so when you start looking at the back end of everyone's on site and they all of a sudden clash something and they have to call people up to remove it it's huge dollars, it's millions of dollars, right? So it's easy for us to create, like I said, they weren't fancy, they weren't like, you know, really polished. Um, all they were was a designer basically at a screen moving a, a piece of object around as she would move it around, she'll take screenshots of it. And each time she does that, she starts to create a vid video for it. So our designers are really not spending a lot more time. They were doing this anyways. And like I said, because we have those tools on our computers, like Windows Editor or like these, these video things that are really easy to use, just whenever you come across something, create a clip for us and we'll include that as part of our story at the end, anything that can help our design. Amazing. Uh, so has anybody in the audience has saved uh, money using VR or AR? Since you, some of you have worked in this before, I'm just curious if you had any, I mean, and just show of hands, like have, has you seen this be successful and you're amazing. So, um, the the communication with your team to get to, to extract something out of your team where they may already have these tools but they don't know it yet. Um, I think that that is also one of the things we've you know we've sort of stumbled upon as we've experimented with we've kept experimenting with this. But how hard is it to get management? Maybe we can have some uh, you know maybe uh, Sean or you could share you know what is it like to get buy-in inside of a big project? to say, we're gonna deploy this thing. It may have drift, it may not be able to precisely you know, give us the exact location, there may be some tolerance of things not being exact, uh, but what are the, some of those uh, challenges or bottlenecks uh, in the, in the buy-in process? Well, I, I think the value comes in, and, and really my experience has been more from the VR side, uh, being able to bring the data in and provide it to the client uh, we do a lot of work where we're doing a lot of as building, so we're capturing a lot of information in various GIS formats. And we need a good way to show our client that information against the real world, because they're going out there and they're doing live design work. So what this facilitates is they can go in and not only see our data, but they can see the environment around it. So if they have to make quick decisions on adjusting a design, they know where they can make those adjustments to based on the surrounding data. So it adds a lot of value, and we have clients that, that already pay for that kind of service because it allows their team to go in and make quick design, design decisions outside of what they typically ask us to collect. So they can do supplemental measurements and do things like that. Yeah. So let's see here, so Martin, uh, Tell us about your experience now a little bit more. I want to hear more about Magic Week 2 a little bit, if you could share. Um, I saw, we saw the video, we saw how people were using it, uh, and I've experienced, I've worn a Magic Week 2. You guys saw in the video earlier, I was using it at a client. We were walking around trying to show somebody what a uh, commercial real estate space would look like with a new uh, build out. And uh, we had, you know, in, in certain, in certain applications, I can see where it would be easy to say, like, here, go ahead and put this these on. And what have, what have been some of the other feedback you've gotten from people? Or maybe you can share more about just specifics when you were out in the field. 
Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Not, not everybody had the, had the chance to use it. Uh, I must say it's a, it's a fantastic device. You know, it's, it's a really, really good device. I think the best I've seen on the construction site. It's the first one that actually is usable on the construction site because the field of view is vertical. So you can actually see where you're stepping. So from a health and safety perspective, that is super important. And uh, you are able to walk sites, like with Charlotte, in Boston, we were walking sites for half an hour each, you know, walking around, talking, one person would have the magic leap, the other two would have iPad, but you know, so we can see, you know, what, 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 what the first one is seeing. Really, really cool device. But, it, you know, we can show you, we have the magic leap here, and uh, we actually, together with our partners, uh, Bimstream, um, and Navis, uh, we created a digital twin of this, um, this facility. Um, uh, last year they did the scan, so we've got the convention center in Magic Leap, we can walk around, also have some really nice interiors, so you can see really cool details, you can, you know, it's very precise, I mean, they use it in surgeries, right? They use it for medical purposes. So imagine you bring that into AEC, and now you have, you know, a laser precise device that doesn't move. You don't have to recalibrate you really you just set it up once and then you just walk you know and, and so you know that's that's uh unseen but let's see you know i'm sure there's there will be devices that will come this year that will maybe be even better we'll see um you know one thing is overheating um in in, in the desert where we use it a lot uh we're looking to you know well coming summer uh we'll see how it will perform in you know which is of course normal. Uh, so, you know, we don't think, even the manufacturers don't expect that it will, it will perform really well, but, you know, we'll try it. So, that will be the magic, thing. magically three, right? We'll get the, will <laughs> get it right on the next uh, version. Um, Nick, I was, I was looking at your, uh, what you were sharing, and I was thinking about Hollywood. I know you guys were joking about the Academy earlier, but uh, I think that I was, I was having this moment going, wait a second, like this is virtual production. This is green screen. This is, uh, you know, we're trying things out as a team remotely before we actually go in, and, and especially in AEC, we're saving time, we're saving money. So um, how much do you think that this is, you know, I mean, you're focused on AEC, but have you seen, you know, other sort of crossovers like that, or where what you're doing, you see applications for other things that come up, like creative uses for this, besides what you're doing? Is that a question for me? Yeah. Okay. The answer is yes. So, um, we are currently putting most of our focus in AEC when it comes to XR, but we also have products who do XR stuff in the manufacturing space, specifically in automotive. Uh, for review, for ideation, for sketching, and in the Amity space, uh, for virtual production, to your point, absolutely. Um, there, you might have heard some of the stories around some of the famous movies that we can't name who are building them, but the virtual stage, virtual production, it's changing how people work uh, from, from very, very early on, and saving them tremendous amount of money, but not only that, in m and &E, uh, the environment in which you're now filming allows them to have a better um, a better sense for the actors of what the full film will be looking like with post effects but as they film so they they are able to be better immersed in terms of uh, sentiment and the way they act uh, and the way we inter they interact with the other actors on the set so there's value to be to be delivered across the board in all the industries for sure I want to invite anybody who wants to ask a question to come up. We have a microphone here in the middle of the aisle if you wanted to ask a question, um, because I want to hear from you. Um, also, uh, Nick, I just another question: How does somebody start their XR journey then? If they're if they're new to this and they had, don't know what are the first things they could do to get into it? Again, for me, right? for you, Nick. Well, I'd like to riff off of what was said for those of you who attended the keynote this morning. I think it was a great, uh, it was more generally speaking for digitization and, and, and modernizing how we work, but that fully applies to XR. That's what I hear when I visit AEC firms all the time. It's the fact that they don't know exactly where they are. They don't know where the value can be delivered to them. And there's so much different tools that they're using across the board that the first thing that I often hear is, let's try to assess where we're at. Let's try to assess where we're struggling. 
and have conversations with your vendors, have conversations with experts, come to conferences like this. But um, what, uh, what I think is the most, first important step is just to assess where you are, understand where you want to be. And then in terms of challenges, we've talked about like buy-in before, that's absolutely key. But there is a, I would say I would add to that, that or maybe even related to that, I think we still have a perception problem when it comes to, to these technologies. People think that they're extremely complex and that they're a little bit still of a game and not really delivering value. And I'm here to tell you that in certain cases, that's not the case at all. So have the conversation and, uh, and, and try to see where you can get the most wins in the early days to convince people of the value that that delivers to your firm. Just a question generally then, uh, what are some other stumbling blocks that we might encounter if we try to roll out uh, XR in our company or on a project? I, I can take that for sure. Um, <clears throat> so being in the industrial space, a lot of times it is the safety aspect that we fought uh, initially because you're in these facilities that you, know, you need a hot work permit because it's not intrinsically safe. All those kind of headwinds often meant people didn't even want to touch it. And, you know, originally it was just like, it, no, no, let's not even go down that path. It's too risky, that sort of thing. So for us, quite often what we try to do is find areas where we can just go ahead and implement it. And then when we're able to showcase the results of that to the client and the cost savings, unfortunately, it's usually money talks. If we can showcase why this using this device for this situation save them X amount of dollars, then the conversation switches from, it's too dangerous to be like, okay, how do we make it safe enough to actually use this? Because we actually need to use this because it's saving us this amount of money on each project. And I think you said, was it the number you uh, deployed and used a reality capture on? You said 600 projects, is that right? Do I have my number right? Yeah, we've done over 600 uh, scan projects over the last about three, four years, yeah. I think that's a staggering number. Knowing how complicated some of these projects are and how big they are, uh, are these small? I'm just curious, like what's the scope? Are they yeah. little things like scan this room and so, tell me where all the outlets are? For sure. Like what are, what are we talking about in terms of complexity? So I think what changed for us was bringing it and teaching our designers and engineers how to do the scans themselves. So it meant if you're going to site and you're gonna take pictures of a photo, you're taking a 3D camera now and you're getting a 3D scan. That being said, we do have a standard of practice for, and we have our reality capture experts and some surveyors for when it does get to the magnitude that we need the exact geo reference and survey control and that sort of thing, that we do implement it for that. But we honestly use it on every type of project. If you just start going to scan an electrical room, scan it 3D so at least we know where everything is, versus now we need this entire plant done, which we might do a little differently. But that's why 95% of our jobs in Canada we're doing by scanning first. Martin, you, for example, some of the stuff you were showing, these were aerial scans, I'm guessing done with drone, like some of that was drone. So there's a big difference, right, between deploying a drone out and having somebody who just has somebody, you know, with a, I don't know, Avacore or a Pharaoh in their car and rolls up. There's different skill levels, there's different knowledge needed, I'm guessing, to be able to, to do these different kinds of, you know, levels of detail and, and the height as well. So. Are you mostly focused on trying to do these large, you know, much bigger, large scale uh, outdoor scans? Is that really the focus? Um, not, not necessarily, right? So this, this is not really a question to me. I, I'll have to or, uh, <coughs> provide more details on, on the technologies. But, you know, it's, it's all about a use case, right? Wherever it makes sense, uh, as to Mark's point and to, to Nick's point earlier. You know, I mean, you shouldn't be just doing this for the sake of it. You, you really need to find a use case that works. Uh, for the for the client, and then you know, this is a means to to uh, you know basically providing a solution um, and to save money to to make things more efficient. So one great example is using the drones to to scan sort of the forest, for instance, something that we can try uh, after we finish here. It's amazing uh, the amount of difference it makes, um, and I'll, I'll let you speak about the algorithms because that's really your. You, you know your wheelhouse, but but you can just fly in to the uh, to the deployment cloud, and you can do the measurements, right? Whereas otherwise, you would need to send an engineer, you know, charge thousands of dollars uh, in a potentially
virtually unsafe environment, go somewhere, park, you know, try to get to a side of a highway, count trees and do the measurement, you know, and then you need to do it repeatedly, right? So, so this is just a you know, very straightforward use case that uh, it, you know, uh, Shandor and his team came up with. Um, but um, I, I, I want you to say a little bit about the algorithms. Uh, I'd just like to touch on too that uh, you know, it really comes down to scale of the project size that determines how you want to view this data. So, for example, we run, on, we run mobile LiDAR, static LiDAR, aerial LiDAR, UAS LiDAR, and fixed wing LiDAR. So we, we could be scanning a room, or we could be scanning thousands and thousands of acres. We can still put that into this environment where you can go in and see if we're doing any kind of extraction. If you're doing a tree measurement, you can do that on top of a mountain that is near impossible to access. Just by going out, flying it, collecting that LiDAR data, and then moving in and being able to precisely take, take your fingers and essentially say, I want to measure from here to here. And then we can calculate the circumference of trees. We can take height measurements. It really gives you, like as I talked about in the presentation, it gives you that ability to access the inaccessible. And I think that's really the key. Um, you know, when you're looking at these types of technologies, it gives you a way to get to some place you couldn't yeah, I mean, and we're in Colorado, right? So vegetation management is a huge topic. I think that we can't, uh, you know, underestimate uh, the impact these technologies will have when you look at things that seem like they are problems that are far too vast for anybody to tackle alone, right? And so being able to deploy uh, the, these kinds of solutions and know how to hit it from from which different kind of technology and hardware. And so, you know, and then what you're going to do with it when you get back to the office and everybody's, you know, collaborating. I think that that's uh, this is going to be a game changer. So, uh, but I, this brings me back, I think, also to uh, what Bill was saying before about wanting to tag the say it again. Yeah, the, hyperlink the, the, the world. Hyperlink the world. The hyperlinking the world. Different infrastructure technologies. And many years ago, I started working in laser scanning field and gained a real appreciation for what's going on with surveying and the locating work and learning all about GIS. And there's this location intelligence. There's so much information about where things are out there. And it's so important, you know, Nick was talking about that at the end of the circle, that operations and maintenance, you know. You build a building, you build this digital twin. You started with a BIM model. You got all this data behind the BIM. You move into a digital twin space and you get all this data over there. And I really, I have a very similar chart and I show a pipe with a big leak. Everything that you lose and the connections and the brick walls and the silos. And all that information, you know, you built the dam in a couple of years, but it's going to be in service for a hundred years. Right? And all that information is there and finding, getting back to it. I think we have a lot of these technologies are just converging to be great solutions to that problem, right? We're, the world's digitizing, but there's there's something needs to kind of be the commodity layer, right? The, and the metaverse is a great place for that. If I can go in there and look and see, you know, whether it's VR or AR or, you know, and let's throw some more letter pairs in there of ML and AI, and they all start working together, you know, it's like, hey, chat GPT, you know, tag everything in this room for me that has to do with electrical, because I need to figure out what's going on, right? So, yeah, it's kind of crazy what we're going to see. It's crazy what we're going to see, and that information layer on the places that we go and work uh, is exactly what we're talking about, is that um, coming together. So we do have a question from the audience. Can you maybe introduce yourself just briefly? Tell us where you're from. Yeah, hi, friends. Uh, Mike Kwan from uh, IPG in Boston. Uh, so there are millions of people playing video games right now, and those video games are built on Unreal and Unity. What about those products in this world? Thank you for thank you for the question. Um, and just to make sure you're you're just generally wondering what about those products? How do we think they could impact what we've been talking about today, right? Um, so to be clear, I don't believe that you need a real-time engine for every AR or VR or XR application. 
I don't think they're required for everything. Now, whether it's a game engine or other firmware, or a real-time engine of some sort, they do provide, in many cases, and a key layer to the stack that you need to build those XR experiences that I would argue as most AC firms and professionals do not want to have to deliver and build themselves. And I would actually go further, and I would say that for us as a vendor at August, we made the decision to leverage other real-time technologies. That piece of the stack, even for us, is not an area where we want to differentiate. So yeah, I do think that whether it's Unity, Unreal, or others, they bring value and they will help you accelerate your, your development for sure. I don't recommend you start building that yourself. Um, that, like I said, we decided not to do that ourselves at all. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Unless, um, does that answer your question, at least partially? Yeah, I don't know. When, I don't know if the others want to try. Yeah, I, I think it's a real standard sort of technology curve. I mean, we saw the hype cycle, but in the technology curve, you know, something we talk about is vertical integration. There's a horizontal technology like cars or planes, and then certain verticals start taking advantage of them. Right, with planes, we started crop dusting, started delivering the mail. So you see these game technologies because of. You know, this huge industry has driven that technology forward vertically for, you know, entertaining a teenager or me late at night. But the vertical integration, how is that important to a roadway owner? How is that important to a water system? How is that important? So you start seeing that and all the big companies look, I mean, they've, Autodesk has, you know, uh, deals in place and APIs with all of these tools, right? I mean, it's just happening, and it's that utilization of technology, applying it as a tool for this other job that needs to be done. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, just shortly. So, so Unity and Unreal, um, we actually use both. Um, I think they're they're very uh, very strong, and they are uniquely positioned to do their thing better. You know, and so Unity is more of an enterprise. And in Unreal, on the other hand, it's a bit harder to, to set up, but then it's you know really beautiful visualizations. So uh, definitely good to be versed in both. It's not for everyone, so um, you know it's it's you know something that you need to consider before getting into it. Uh, we have Unity and Unreal specialists on the team that actually do this, uh, and it's, you know these people are hard to find. You know, um, also we work with Babylon JS, uh, which is another you know tool that, that we use that we're exploring it's an open source really cool uh, really cool platform so yeah definitely very very useful uh, in terms of digital twins you know what we found and how we architectured our uh, platform is that you know we decouple the unity the unreal the Babylon js and, and, and whatever 3d modeling 3d model visualization layer and then we put uh, a component on top of it that that does uh, serve as a black box for data, right? Because, you know, the 3D engines showing data are not, you know, they're not designed for that. Uh, not that they couldn't do it, they can, but it's harder, it's not so scalable. So we like to decouple and, you know, in terms of architecture, you know, uh, this, we found this is a, a really good way to, to strategically position ourselves, um, how to work with these vendors, um, and also be able to put any kind of data on top of the 3D model. So, uh, and not to mention, of course, that we have another generation, an entire generation, who is now growing up with uh, spatial awareness and 3D awareness, right? So, and then their managers in the future, how will they expect to see their data, right, in these environments? We have a question from the audience. If you could please introduce yourself. Yeah, hey, my name is Justin Gibson with Digital Real Estate Asset Management out of Fort Lauderdale. Um, I've been having some bad experiences with uh, accuracy in outdoor environments, especially in the city. I'm wondering if there's any advancements, maybe SLAM, DPS, something that can bring that accuracy down to like centimeter inch. Thank you. And you're talking like AR in the real yes, world? Yeah. Okay, then, yeah, sure. So that was a point. You know, I had 30 minutes of material I delivered in 10 minutes, so I kind of moved a little quickly. But, um, you know, out of the box, uh, iPad can find out where you are in the earth with about within about 30 feet. And if you turn it off and turn it back on, it's 30 different feet, right? It's very, you know, com consumer grade. But like I was saying, you can get a bad elf, uh, 
little stopwatch style GPS, GNS, you hang around your neck, and now it'll get you down to about a meter of accuracy. Again, the compass is, is not that great, so things that are far away, most software have some kind of mitigation, show you a map, or you can pick a point pointer, or, or set up beacons, other things. But throwing hardware at it is the way to do it. The other thing that's happening, I didn't show, I showed that one thing from Google showing the real-time VPS of all the points it's tracking. Well, you can find a picture of the globe of how much of the Earth Google has mapped using Street View photogrammetry. And they have huge, it's not, you know, it's order of hundreds of cities, but I mean, they have huge amounts. So the technology is coming along. Right now, you have to decide how you want to do it. If, if you own a certain area, you might be able to come in and scan that area and create an exemplar model, put in a very uh, bespoke VPS, or you can start throwing some hardware at the problem, set out some beacons, set up a little bit of a, one of the company's ICT tracker, I think it was, inside the buildings, they set up multiple beacons and then triangulate between those beacons and just tie you into the building. And you can set them up in a few minutes. So there's, you can throw hardware at it. All of us are trying to solve the problem or find people who have solved it so we can use their stuff. <laughs> Hope that helps. Um, uh, absolutely. The, what, if I had to bet, what I think is gonna happen is that we're gonna get a lot smarter about, and you talked about that, Bill, a little bit in your presentation, about combining uh, geopositioning with the ability to recognize the objects and the surroundings yeah, from, yeah. from the model. So depending on the use case, but for most use cases, you don't go into a brand new spot with, without having some sort of idea of what's there. Yeah. So we're going to be able to start recognizing the objects and automatically positioning where you are and recognizing it and really anchoring the virtual in the virtual world and in the physical space. And when that's a thing for real and yeah. it just works, it's going to deliver tremendous. Yeah, there's so many smart people working on it. We've been playing around with the thing. If you're familiar with OpenStreetMap or any kind of a mapping tool, it'll show you footprints of buildings, right? Well, we play around with extruding those because we know where they are geographically and then finding those surfaces and using them to position ourselves. So just in real time, taking a surveyor's work where he gave me the building footprint at some point in the past. And so there's so many ways to try and skin this cat. But a lot of people are working on it. I mean, it's getting, there's parts, you won't know it, but there's parts of San Francisco with an Apple phone, your accuracy will blow your mind because they've been implementing technologies and they've turned them on in those areas. But it's still, it's, it's coming better to the consumer space. But in, you can throw some hardware at it. It usually needs to have a little bit of something inside whatever software you're trying to use. Okay, so. With that, I think we are wrapping up this session, and I want to say thank you to our speakers, and thank you to the audience. Thanks to Ted, thanks to Julie, and uh, yeah, come chat with us. <laughs>